Hi, good morning everyone. Which is you what I be fat, <laughs> Hi, let's do it again. Good morning everyone. This is Ifat, your G Plus go to gal. And today in Tech Talks, we are talking to three writers um, about the process of writing. How do you do the research? How do you come up with the ideas for fiction? How do you go about it actually putting it all together? Um, and so we have with us today Adam Boeing. Is that right? It's pronounced Bainick. Bainick. And, and I don't expect anybody to pronounce it right. <laughs> we'll just go with Adam. And Ayo? Yep. No? Ayo. And Yana, I cannot even try to do your name. <laughs> your last name. Nistrum. <laughs> Nistrum. <laughs> and um, Adam and Ayo are fiction writers. Um, and Yana is nonfiction, and we're going to talk about the entire process. And then, if you guys have questions, put them in the stream. Um, if you guys share it to your stream, Adam, Eo, and Yana, I can actually grab all the comments and I can um, tell them to ask the questions from the stream and also from YouTube. So, anyone who's watching, submit your questions. Um, let's start <coughs> with. Fiction. How do you come? How do you even start with it? Where do you get the ideas to get started writing a book? Adam, you first introduce yourself, and then we'll go to you. I don't know what to say. I'm Adam Bainick. I write primarily fiction, as she mentioned, and I write mostly short stories slash fiction, that kind of thing. I'm actually working on a revision and doing a short story collection right now. And where do I get my ideas? Well, that's an interesting question, you fat. I'll have to think about it. I get my ideas from all over the place. I get my ideas mostly from images, which I crowdsource. I actually ask various artists in office to submit images, and I use those images to make the story. Now, the, if the concepts that I get from those images, I have no idea. OK. Um, and you're writing poems or no, short stories, fiction and so short stories. I am writing short stories, yes. Okay, and are you compiling them to a book? I am compiling a book right now. That's what I'm working on. It's my current project. Gotcha. Um, okay, Ayo? Um, hi, I'm Ayo. I write novels and short stories and the occasional bit of poetry when the mood strikes me. Uh, <laughs> I, I tend to write pretty much whatever comes to mind. Uh, when it comes to inspiration, though, it can truly be anything. I once wrote an entire novel based on a sentence I heard in a game. <laughs> it just, yeah, a sentence I heard whilst I was playing a game, one of the dialogue sentences has just clicked and I then decided to go and write a novel about it. <laughs> yeah, a lot of uh, times. Sometimes Sorry, Gayub. Yes, I was sometimes sometimes like like Adam says, it can be an image, it can be a song, it can be anything. It, as long as for me at least, a character comes to mind and a challenge for the character. As long as I've got those two elements I can pretty much throw anything together. And but you uh you wrote was that your first novel, uh the Lazarus event? Uh, Lazarus Event, no, that wasn't my first novel. That's uh, probably my fourth full-length novel that I've written. I haven't released any of them. I've only got the one um, book of short stories out there at the moment on Amazon. But, uh, yeah, I've got about got quite a few full-length stories that uh, I'm hoping to get released after editing. So when you, uh, th this novel, um, I was uh, lucky enough to read, and I love it. And um, it's a lot. It's science fiction, and it has a lot of elements of like science that I had to go and research and be like, okay, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> so how do you go about? First of all, coming with you know a novel idea, and then how long does it take you to write it, and what's the process of you know not just inventing you know fiction stuff, but actually making sure that it's based in reality somehow, right? Um, most fiction. A lot of people like a lot of realism in fiction. I just want it to make sense to the person who reads it. Uh, sometimes realism doesn't make enough sense so that I so then I have to go fiction. 
But um, when it comes to writing science fiction, I've just got a background in it. I studied physics, I studied uh, electronics, I studied those things uh, up until I got my degree. So uh, I could apply and understand physical concepts and then explain them in a novel. It's very much a case of write what you know. And if you can't write what you know, then write what you can learn. So you go make it up. <laughs> well, it's not, not, not just that. I mean, the, the things that I end up researching most is when I'm writing period pieces and I need to know what kind of technology was around at the time. I need to know what political slash economic situation was at the time so that I can make the characters' reactions seem like they fit with the era. The last thing I want is, like sometimes you see on a, on a period piece TV show or something like that, where um, there was a book I was reading that was supposed to be based in medieval ages, and the character said, do the math. Now, the character's supposed to be English, so they wouldn't say do the math anyway, <laughs> but you wouldn't have said that in that era. It just does, wouldn't have happened. So I try to avoid those kind of glaring errors, which, which I know that I have a few readers who need to read my work. They will slap me on the face. <laughs> so yeah. how do you go? How long? Um, how long does it take you to do the research? When you start, when you get an idea, how do? You, what's the process of writing? Do you just like dump your ideas on the paper and then go research? Do you? Uh, start with a draft, how do, you, how do you construct that? I tend to just write the story and then as I'm trying to convey something, I will, and if it does really affect the greater environment uh, that the story is based in, then I'll go and research it and then I'll come back and then carry on writing. Um, uh, the novel I'm working on at the moment is based in in London, um, present day, but there are a few parts of it, flashbacks, etc., that happen in um, 1666 during the Great Fire of London, or a few years after that. So I tend to trust Wikipedia, trust historical um, websites and things like that as to what life was like then, what people were doing, who was in charge, things like that. I mean, I. There's a huge gap in my knowledge when it comes to history. I don't know anything about history. I've learned more about history in the past five years of writing these <laughs> few novels than I have at school or anywhere else. So, Adam, is that a different process for you? I avoid the history altogether. I tend to write in modern times. But my background isn't in physics and, and science and chemistry and all that fun stuff. Okay, that's loud. Um, my background lies in theology, mythology, and all that fun stuff, so I tend to write based on, just like everybody else, I write based on what I know. I know it's weird, but what I know is <laughs> theology, mythology, and I usually write based on, oddly enough, like what if this happened, what if this changed, what if these events were caused by this, and then I work from there. And much like Ayub, I will often get a sentence stuck in my head that just has to be written. And a lot of times you'll see when I write, it will start with a single sentence. And that's the sentence that will stuck in my head at the time. And that's the, and everything else just follows that sentence, explains the sentence, why it's there. Do you, uh, do you start with the end in mind, or do you uh, kind of like have a, an idea of how the story is going to go, or does it kind of happen as, it hap as you write it? I know what the concept is, usually. I know, where, I know what is behind the story, if that makes sense. I know what is causing the story to happen, and I, just I basically push the dominoes and watch them fall. Interesting. Are you? Um, just, just to comment on that question, Pifat, it's, uh, for me, all of the above. Sometimes I'll write the ending line, sometimes I'll write first one, sometimes I'll write a scene in the middle, then figure out how they got there and where they go from there. But, yeah, it's all of the above. Are there any rules or any system, like step-by-step, -step that you guys use when you're writing? 
The only rule is write every day. I know you and Adam. I disagree with that rule. I can't. I I just can't do it. For one thing, oddly enough, I cannot write every every day. It would drive me nuts. I actually I have a system worked out with my editor where I have I actually have a system set up like on a spreadsheet. I have a primary objective, I have a secondary objective, and I have the miscellaneous. I work on the primary mainly. Then I work on the secondary. These are my projects. I am working on my main. My main project is my revisions right now. And this this well, does have um, something I, to do with the actual process well, of writing. Yeah, if I write every day, it doesn't mean you write something creative every day. Um, even my question of the day that I post is part of my writing. Um, it just helps me put words together in sentences just so that I stay in practice. But, I mean, even that, I tend to sometimes go into stories on those, so. <laughs> Do you get ideas from Google Plus Is stuff that happens in your stream? I know Adam does, right? Oh, yeah. I get ideas all over the place, just like every other writer you ever asked that question. But you, uh, <laughs> you started, I remember at the beginning, you started posting pictures or asking people to send you pictures. And then you wrote about that? I do write pictures. I, I write stories based on images because I'm a very visual writer. If I, descri if I write a story, it is my part of my goal that you can actually see it. That's interesting. Uh, you're, you're totally different, right? Um, my, my main focus when it comes to writing are the characters. I try to create as believable characters as possible. Uh, and I try to humanize them as much as possible in that um, they will sometimes do something that they're really not supposed to do or sometimes their emotions will get in the way and um, cause problems or things like that. I try to do that more than anything else just to get people more involved with the protagonists. Um, so Sometimes I will create a story out of nothing. I'll spin a story out of thin air just because I've created this character that I just want to throw into something. So for you guys, it sounds like it's more kind of like fun, like a game. You're like, okay, what's going to happen today and how am I going to take it and what's going to come to my mind and where my inspiration is going to come from? The term is organic. <laughs> yes. So that's all. Do you uh, do you work on more than one story at a time? Yes. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Very much so. I don't at all. Not even close. Yeah, you I, liar. <laughs> no, come on. I'm working I know on exactly three how many stories right now. Going at the moment, dude. I know how. Yeah, I know how many projects you got. You're going. You've got yeah, going at I. The moment, so don't give me that. <laughs> And I was like, I definitely don't work on just one story at a time. <laughs> I actually, uh, I'm working on my revisions. I'm working on uh, another side story, which is called Shards of Heaven, which should be posted sometime next week with any luck. It was supposed to be posted last week, but I got distracted. <laughs> and I'm working on an interactive story just for those of you on Google Plus who want to enjoy the the creative process, so to speak. So what is that? Can you talk about that? Uh, which one? The creative the interactive, story? The interactive story. How, how's that going to happen? Okay, the interactive story. Mm, pardon me. The interactive story is essentially going to be I set up a scenario, I create a character, and then I give you a couple of options that you can choose. Now, of course, you will be able to post your own options, but ba essentially... I keep saying basically. That sounds absolutely terrible. Essentially, you will be able to vote on how the character reacts to a given situation. Okay. And there, he will have his own strengths and his own set of weaknesses. And based on those strengths and weaknesses, it can go several different ways. And there will be an element of random to this, which I'm not going to talk about because I don't want to seem like a nerd on air. <laughs> <laughs> Too, late. No. <laughs> oh, too much of a nerd. Okay, look, people, I'm going to go roll a d20. I'm not kidding. 
<laughs> Too late, you're already a nerd. <laughs> well, I can't help it. It's um, what I do. But you see, it's at least once or twice a year I get a story that I get so passionate about that it just completely fills my mind that I have to sit and write. The one that you mentioned, if at the Lazarus event, that was written all well, fifty odd thousand words of it in eight days. I wow. sat down and started writing. And I took breaks for sleeping and eating and joining Google Plus because it was a time when Google Plus was first <laughs> launched that I started writing that. And yeah, eight days, boom, done. Uh, I tend to do that when it comes to NaNoWriMo as well, which is a national novel writing month because it's in November. If I get um, inspiration for that, then I will just sit down and write that one story for as many hours of the day as I have. But usually it several stories on the run and any other little things that come to mind. That's pretty cool um, because it sounds like you guys just sit down and let it flow. Do you ever get writer's block? And if you do, what do you do? Yes. Oh, regularly. And that's when I work on something else for about five minutes. When I, when I get writer's block, I tend to take my camera out and go photography, photograph hunting, just just in case the, a photograph I take or something like that will inspire some writing. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So you basically do something differently, different, but still creative, still in the realm of inspiration. Yeah, yeah. That's nice. And so when did you guys start writing? When did you discover that you have this you know, skill with words. Adam, you go first. I was thinking, um, I wrote my first novel when I was 16, and nobody's read it, and nobody's going to read it, and we are not going to discuss this ever again. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, no, right. no, my editor has read it, and she, and for a 16-year-old, it's pretty darn good. When I first, when I actually first discovered that I had this skill with words, was in sixth grade. Okay, what I you was. How old is that? No okay, I got to think about this. I was ten or eleven, something like that. But uh, mm -hmm. no, I understand the question, Ayub. I don't feel insulted. I know I look young. Um, no, I just I just uh, don't know how the grade system works because our system over here is different. That's all. Um, but basically, what happened was I was a very bad student, and I refused to do my homework. And so one day she looked at me and said, "Here's what you're going to do. You're going to make up all of those missed journals all at once." And there was a grand total of a hundred. <laughs> So I sat down and I wrote um, 100, 200, something like that. I wrote a novel in the span of about two weeks, three weeks, because I had to get it done or I would fail the class. Wow, and so here's an example of a punishment turning into a passion, into a career. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, who says teachers don't <laughs> contribute to your life? <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, I also started writing at around age 11. Um, just, it just happened to go that way. I, uh, I just started in a new school, and the English teachers were very much focused on encouraging creative minds at the time, so I was just writing story after story after story every week, just started short, they got longer, they had sequels, <laughs> all sorts of crazy things, but yeah, um, even back then it was mainly science fiction and <coughs> things like that, so it was good fun for me, uh, and after that I went into engineering, um, the sciences fairly heavily, but even then, at home, to relax, I was writing or reading in between doing homework and things like that. It was either writing or reading. I'll pop in here and tell my 
youthful story, which is not so... <clears throat> well, it's quite opposite from Adam's, actually. I used to read a lot. I used to read about 25 to 30 books every month. And I went to library, and I came back with two big bags, and I read all sorts from uh, the Second World War stories of uh, you know spies going from Finland to Russia and, and everything based on true stories to historical novels to of course Agatha Christie and uh, I, I, I actually I read a huge amount I started reading in English when I was about 15 and I started with Thackeray <laughs> which is no. which was a bit ambitious <laughs> And, uh, but anyway, so my teacher, my, my Finnish teacher, Finnish language teacher, uh, when I wrote essays, I, I thought I wrote good essays, but I was mimicking the author whose books I had been reading. So I was writing in the style of famous authors, and he failed, she failed everything. She said just, you're just copying even though it was my own topic, but I was just writing and using, you know, the like uh, sentence structures and everything, like Agatha Christie or or a Finnish famous lady writer Kari Utria who writes uh, historical novels. So I was actually using their sentence structures and everything when I was like 12, 13. And you know, she uh, just she just bashed me. You know. Yeah, no, you know when they uh, when when you copy from one person, it's plagiarism, right? When you copy from a lot of people, it's research. Yeah, but <laughs> no, but I mean, I mean, I didn't copy like texts, but I was writing in their style, and she recognized the style, and the topics were my own. But I was and I was switching, you know, between each essay, I was switching between authors. And I thought, uh, I think, I have been thinking now that that was a skill. <laughs> that was an excellent that skill. To, to to mimic like that. And then I didn't write anything uh, until in my, la in, in, in my late 30s or something, you know, when uh, I started work in a travel agency and uh, this was the mid-90s, and they needed a website, and they didn't have much money. I was working there. I was, you know, selling uh, people. I was sending people to trips to Thailand and everywhere, and uh, they didn't have much money. So I said, okay, so I can produce content. I had never done it. And I just started writing, you know, about the destinations where I'd been, because I had been working as a tour guide for eight years. So I had lived in several countries. And uh, I just started, and it was fact finding again. It was facts which I then sort of dressed in flesh for the website. And I ended up, I worked in the travel agency for nearly 16 years, and I made four different websites. And the latest one is still in use. I, I quit the, the job two years ago, and uh, the latest uh, website is still in use. It has been voted the best travel website in Finland, and it has over 40,000 objects. Wow. And I put everything in it. Even uh, of the photos, about 80% were mine. So that's, I just sort of, you know, learned how to write in my later days and uh, in my middle age, and, uh, and uh, I just, uh, I don't know, I, I've never even tried writing fiction since, but well, now Yana, nice you're doing you're doing a great job because um, you were were you found by Guy Kawasaki and asked to help him do the research for what's the plus? He, yes, he sent me a private message. I think it was in November. A short message stating, "I have heard that you know the most about Google Plus than anyone else." And I have a book coming, can you help me with the technical and, and you know, etiquette and, and all this side. And I was, at first, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I replied, of course, it's a great honor, it's a huge honor. And, and if I'm only good enough for the, for the job. And, and uh, then he started writing and, and 
my Dropbox was banging all the time, you know, he was sending like five, six, seven times a day new versions of uh, of the chapters and of the book and I was reading them and, and uh, I was writing, you know, notes and, and this would be better, no, and, and you can also do this one because I had really, really spent a lot of time in Google Plus and uh, so I knew almost everything that there was to know about, you know, the technical side, the how-to how side, which is, which is good and uh, no, he, he was really, it was really nice and I got to see how he wrote, which was really interesting because um, I think he didn't need a lot of uh, editing in his text. You know, just some, maybe one end was missing in a word or something when he had been typing fast or because he was really, really bringing out the stuff. And even from the beginning, it was the same shape book like it is when it's a finished product and it was nice to see how he also put the flesh around the facts and wrote a very very entertaining book of a fairly dull or boring subject it might be but uh, anyway it's, he, he did a great job and I, I learned quite a lot on that so journey. When he was uh, when he was writing the book was he um this is just dumping everything that he knew and then he asked other people to find images to kind of support what he did because his book no. is very easy, right? No, 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 no. No, no. he found the images also himself. He actually, I think he used one or two from my posts. Uh, he used one or two good ones from other people's posts, but I think he had found them because he uh, uh, actually, is especially in the beginning, I don't remember if they are in the finished version of the Kindle, Kindle book, but uh, because he had this very nice Mac-based uh, screenshot program or something which cost $68 or something which I want to buy, that made the shadow, you know, like you don't have to do anything in a Photoshop or anything to add the shadow around the picture. So he had actually taken all those himself. I knew it from that because they were all with a nice sort of, I don't know how you call it in English. Just a it's drop shadow. shadow. Yeah, something like that, yeah. But so he actually sat down and wrote the entire book himself? Yes, he did. Except the, the photography part, which is actually it has somebody else's name there too. I was only checking his facts about Google Plus and making some suggestions like with just lines that here you might uh, say something about A, this, B, this, three, this and then he did it himself. That's right. And, and because I, I read the unfinished all the time and, uh, and I saw how it was developing and uh, it really yeah, and, and because we were emailing and discussing the thing and everything, so he really did it. He wrote it himself. So what did you, uh, what did you take from that and what can people who are watching this and want to write those kind of, you know, manual can, can learn from the way Guy was creating his book? Well, I think because Guy has been writing many books. I've read, uh, for instance, Enchantment. Mm -hmm. I like it very much. And he was writing from his own life. He was dipping into the well of his own experiences, which is the best way if you want to write not just a very dull or boring stuff, but like he tells anecdotes and he has met so many people that everybody knows, you know, and, and he, he wrote about his time with in, in Apple and everything. And that is very important. He actually he put his personality into the book. And that, that, like, that is very good. So it sounds like what you're saying is that writing fiction and nonfiction is kind of like similar because you bring your own experience into your writing. Exactly, yes. But uh, with the fiction, I think you might need a bit more uh, imagination, but with the uh, nonfiction, you need to check a hell of a lot of facts. <laughs> <laughs> I actually want to add to that, if I may. Yes. So far as the and so far as your own real life experiences, 
affecting your writing. Aside from the classic backstory about how all great writers have a terrible, terrible history. <laughs> um, no, but seriously, a lot of my own experiences are in the stories, if you look for them, because they're what I know, they're what I understand. I can put myself in a character's place in that situation because I have been through it myself. So it, given the choice, but to, given the choice, if, if I have a broad range of horrible, horrible things that I can do to a character to just ruin their life, I'm going to choose a way yeah. something that ruined my life. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 yes, that, that, that's a great, great place to start. Sometimes, however, dependent on your characters, there are certain things that may have happened to you that may not be possible to happen to them, but yes. <laughs> so that's actually very interesting because when you have different characters, you have, like you said, totally different personalities and totally different ways of looking at things. How do you manage to think in like, you know, five different ways of thinking. One of them might be totally conservative, the other one might be really racist. You know, how do you get into that mindset? That's where the imagination comes in. If there were a ver if there were an easy way to answer that question, this would would be where I put it. <laughs> but let me let, 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 let me just uh, elaborate on that for a second. <coughs> No matter how much people want to admit it or not, everybody is capable of seeing the point of view of somebody they despise. That's true. Uh, everybody's capable of thinking the thoughts that, that would otherwise make them sick to their stomach. Uh, writers tap into that. Writers tap into their the bits of the brain which, because we all have those voices in our head that say, hey, maybe that is right, you know, <laughs> whatever. Maybe writers, or maybe writers just have louder voices, I don't know. <laughs> but it is possible to, um, to put yourself in a position to make a character do something or say something that there's absolutely no way you would do. I mean, a lot of what I write is horror. And a lot of it is grisly, a lot of it is murder, a lot of it is death, and I am not a violent person, but read some of my stuff, you might think I am. <laughs> yeah, um, I write a lot of horror too, but I write a different kind of, I write a, I write a subsection of horror which is, is, which is unlike what Ayub writes. Ayub tends toward the supernatural, and I tend toward the natural, but really messed up. <laughs> so, uh, but the fact matter is, um, if, like I'm, I'm tying in this into what he's saying. I do a lot of writing that involves serial killers, sociopaths, that kind of thing. With well, serial killers, is actually a subsection of sociopaths, but. So the thing about sociopaths is you have to be able to think like someone who thinks nothing of anybody else. To me, that is entertaining. <laughs> That's why <laughs> I, I write that it. That can be entertaining. It is entertaining. It is fun. And part of the fun is, you know all those terrible people you meet in life that are only alive because it is illegal? <laughs> Those people, they're gone now. Goodbye. <laughs> I will see you. <laughs> this is like some sort of therapy, right, Adam? This it sounds like your own little therapy, you know. It, it I is. Just is. All on the page out there. Writing is therapy. It always will be therapy. And that's part of the reason why every famous writer who will ever write anything worth reading has a terrible, terrible history because, by God, they're going to get back at their parents. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, 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 I think that 90% of the writers, definitely, or most of the writers, because like, we'll, we don't want to get into a discussion about statistics, most of the writers out there do have some sort of pain or whatever in their history. And 
I mean, yeah, it depends on what kind of writing you're talking about, of course. But yeah, it's it's one of those things that, I mean, it doesn't have to be a major pain, to be honest. It can just be something that you can ex extrapolate from. It's like uh, songwriters, um, right? M&M. <laughs> yep. so, um, so if anyone, it sounds like what you're saying is that anyone really can find um, in themselves why right, the ideas and the ability to write stuff. And like what you're saying in the comments is like there are no rules. Just put your soul out there, speak from your heart. And like Yana was saying, you know, you bring your own experience into the writing, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. And so yeah. Yana, when you yeah. write nonfiction, how do you go about, you know, the research? Where do you find your information? How do you verify that? How do you know that, you know, when you start writing, you know, there's like a chronological, sensible order to what you're putting on the page? Well, for me, it's uh, with my book, which is about Google Plus for new users. It's easy because I start from the beginning. <laughs> And then I go to the middle, <laughs> and uh, at the end there's you know some links and stuff. But uh, no, really, um, of course I start from the beginning. I start with the very basics like how to do your profile page and and everything, and and then we discuss about posting. And I'd like to think of it as a uh, dialogue or duologue actually with the reader that we discuss things together. I tell the reader stuff and uh, sort of uh, not just like you should do like this or you should do like this, but I, I sort of hint and suggest and show the reader ways how they could make Google Plus a nice place for them, a better place for them, how they can get into the platform so that uh, they really understand what it's all about and not that they would go looking like I, I mentioned that the first thing when you have your profile done after that is not to go and look for for your uh, friends or, or family or something like that no the first thing is to circle at least 300 people, total strangers perhaps. Of course, at that point I explain about the search, about the hashtags, about the explore. And uh, well, after the uh, yeah. UI changed, I really had to redo quite a lot of stuff in, in the book. For, for instance, all the screenshots. <laughs> But yeah, that's uh, a lot of work. yeah, yeah. But uh, in in a way, it was good because uh, the book just got thicker because I sort of dug deeper and uh, I had the old way of doing things, and now there were some new ways of doing things, and uh, it, it was actually it was good because it made me really look at the thing like from the perspective of someone who hadn't been there since June 29th, like I had. So I, I've really tried to write it so that any old lady from Pihtipudas in Finland could understand and start using Google Plus like my, my 85-year-old mom, for instance. This is, this is my aim, that everybody understands what I'm trying to tell them and um, they can make Google Plus their own but I also take up uh, some points about etiquette and, and, and stuff and things of course but find, it's yes do you find that there's um, when I was trying to you know I was like okay let me do let me write a book about Google Plus and when I was uh, starting I was like okay there's so much information out there you can find everything that you want <laughs> by searching right Guy wrote a basic book, there are tutorials, Dennis is out there, everything that you want is already on the web. So what am I bringing new to the table that nobody knows yet? Do you, do you have the same issue? No, not at all. No. Because it's in Finnish? And, yeah, I will do an English version, yes. But it will be a bit different because of the cultural differences. That's one point, and that is a big point. But, uh, no, it, 
mine will be totally different because it's mine and I put my own experiences in the book it has my own unique way of writing like they were people were chatting here about grammar and stuff and uh, I'm, I'm I'm writing quite a lot as I speak so it won't be very tick 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 but uh, I'm trying to make the people comfortable like like I, I write in my blog I, I started blogging in February actually or was it end of January because I wanted to try out what kind of text people liked and I have done I've done extensive testing also in Google Plus both in Finnish and in English and uh, made uh, research about what kind of texts sort of what type of people like and there is a huge difference between the English speaking word world and and the Finns and that is that is funny and this is why I cannot just if I make the book in Finnish now I cannot just translate it in English no that right. wouldn't work I have to rewrite it in English well actually I've done about half of the English one already that's a lot of work and all you all you guys have like over 10,000 followers do you feel that that's because of your style of writing people connect with you more on Google Plus who goes I, I, th I think that has something to do with it I think people like to be able to read things that they can um, they can connect with I think people like to connect with people or be it because of shared interests be it because of the source of information or be it just because they like the person um, a, a certain amount of skill and communication helps to communicate who you are yeah I it agree makes you a bit more real do you use any writing techniques in your posts, like title, shock titles, or um, you know, keywords, or any different ways that you're trying to grab your audience into reacting? Well, I do. I've been, yeah, I've been known to use a couple of shock titles in the past. Um, not very often, but yeah. Well, not very shocking. I don't use very shocking, but I use images. I try to use images always when I post wherever I post. Facebook or Google Plus or, or whatever so I try to find an, a fitting a fitting image like this is curating or curation that you try to find an image and especially on Google Plus it's so darn easy because you can use the text editor and just like I use a lot of my under uh, my underwater pictures with the fishies and stuff and uh, I, I look for a very ugly stonefish or scorpion fish and uh, I write something about trolling or you know and and I write a post about trolling and then I use this ugly picture at the at the at the post and uh, I think it works quite well especially because they are a bit different not like some vector images which Everybody should, like Tom Elgin said yesterday, everybody should make their own stock photo files. Go out with their phones or cameras and just, you know, snap, snap, snap. All kinds of stuff from coffee cups to leaves and, and use those for the posts and blog posts especially. And unfortunately, now I have to say, shame on many bloggers, even, even the big ones who post blog posts and there are no images you cannot pin them <laughs> you cannot pin them yeah. you have to copy the, the 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 address and then you have to you know pin some other picture and it takes a lot of time they're missing a lot because Pinterest is up and coming I get a lot of uh, business from Pinterest to my blog and also to Google Plus Actually, it's a very short step from Facebook to Pinterest to Google Plus. <laughs> I, 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 I'm very bad with that. I hardly ever put pictures in my posts. It's, um, <laughs> unless I'm yeah. posting an actual picture, I hardly ever do it because uh, I, have, I have thousands of pictures that I've taken. I really need to go through and see what kind of stock pictures I can have. But hmm. what I do find if... Um, you're writing to convey a message and the picture isn't quite what the message is 
uh, or isn't quite perfect, then I've noticed on other people's posts where people will comment more on the picture than the content. That's true. And, I've um, done those tests just, just, too. Are you? Yeah, and just just from my own just from my own um, stubbornness, I want people to post to comment on the content as opposed to the picture. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I, I break that rule. What you're saying is that time. people don't read in Google Plus, huh? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I think <laughs> I think that a lot of people do read. I think that there are a group of people who, if there's a picture, will ignore the text. I actually, one of my favorite things was, I have an unfair advantage in this discussion in that the pictures are provided in that I write the story based around the picture. So the picture always goes with the text. It's kind of how it works. Yeah. But I had someone yell at me once because I used a pic by a guy named a picture by a guy named Zach Bush. Now Zach Bush is a fantastic illustrator. I absolutely adore everything that I have seen by him. I actually have permission to use his images in my blog, on my stream, all that fun stuff. It's fantastic. About time, this is one of my favorite discussions. I had someone tell me that if I was not going to credit the original artist, that by God he was not going to read read the wall of text that was the story that went along with it, because <laughs> I was using images as my hook. And I just kind of always said, I don't need images for my hook. <laughs> I can do this just fine without them. But it was one of those things that struck me as rather irritating at the time. Just back off, breathe. I don't, I don't really care if you read my stuff if you're going to have that kind of attitude. <laughs> so guys, um, is, there, or is there any advice that you can give people, like me for example, Anna, who want to write but struggle with the... Um, struggle with it, just don't know where to start and how to, you know how to create a nonfiction book or uh, to write your own story, what would, you, what would you give them? Oh, good grief. I think I'm the last person who knows the answer to that one. I just started. Let me, let, let, let I me. just felt like it. Yeah, yeah, somebody else, please. <laughs> uh, let, let me feel that one, Yana. Yes. As an example, in fact, I, this current book that I'm writing is part of a larger universe that at least in some part of my mind, is factual. <clears throat> it's the part of my mind that doesn't go out in public. <laughs> but um, just as an example, when you say you don't know where to start, you don't know where to go on, and you don't know where to go from there, um, I've written probably over 150,000 words of text that will never be published because they're all backstory. They're all just me experimenting, trying to figure out how the universe works. And what, what comes out of that is you've got a great body of work that you can then pick and choose the relevant elements from and put them in, package them, send them off. Okay, is it my turn now? Am I safe? <laughs> okay, that's yes. awesome. Okay, we're going to do this simple. Number one, you always go out to those blogs and they always give you the same advice. Never listen to the blogs. <laughs> Number two, if you want to write, start writing. Now, don't ask questions. Number three, keep writing. That's about <laughs> all you can do because in the end, you make your own rules, you write your own story, and nobody else is going to have the same voice as you regardless of who you quote unquote write like. There will always be similar stories. There will be a million authors out there saying, I have written a book just like what you've written. And you can look at them and say, yes, but you will never write them like I do. I love that. That's like, uh, you know, the definition of beauty, right? There are a hundred, uh, what's it called? There's a hundred people like her, but nobody as pretty as her, something like that. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, one of my favorite authors is a guy called Terry Brooks. Oh, and yes. anybody who read his first book knows that it is almost a direct rewrite of Lord of the Rings. So the characters have changed. It's a bit shorter, a bit tighter, but it is almost a rewrite of Lord of the Rings. Which one was the first one? Uh, uh, the Sword of Shannara. Oh, I'd, oh, oh, yeah. There was yeah. something for sale sold. Yeah, yeah, that was that that was one of these um, more original works that came afterwards. Yeah, that was sword, nice. That was really nice. The, yeah. In, in the sword, there was a Gandalf character. There was an Aragorn character. There were the two guys who, in his book, were brothers. That were Sam and um, Frodo. It was it was very much like the Lord of the Rings, with a few of the parts cut out. There was even a Tom Bombadil character, I believe, if I remember correctly. <laughs> but yes, it was. It was... Uh, uh, he wrote it in one book. <laughs> cut out a lot yeah, and wrote it in one book. Books. Yeah, all the ones that followed after, he built on what he wrote that was very similar. He put his own flavor on it, as um, Doc would say. Um, and then he built on it afterwards and built a very unique and different universe that carried on into various other works of his own. Uh, oh. He's he's written dozens of books based on what he wrote in that beginning in the beginning, even though he it was very much a rewrite of Lord of the Rings. So just because it sounds like somebody else or it seems to have the same moving parts as somebody else, as long as you have your voice and you say it the way you want to say it, then nobody's to say otherwise. And do you guys use editors to go over your um, your books and edit them before you publish them? Yes. My I try to whenever I can. My relationship with my editor is a lot like... Uh, tell me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Yana? Yana? Yana, Yana, Yana. Yana, Yana, Yana. Okay, Yana. Um, <laughs> my relationship with my editor is a lot like Guy's relationship Yana. I send I send her the revisions. She sends it back with, okay, this is fantastic, but here's what you can change to make it better. And then I change it. I do all the work myself. I go through and I make sure fix the, all, all the little quirks are fixed. Most of it is along the lines of, okay, you really should replace this with this name because otherwise it's just confusing. But... Yeah, that's, that's how I use my editor. I, I have a, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I have a group of people that read for me and uh, tell me what they think. And I listen to about 50% of what they say um, in terms of direct changes that they tell me that I need to make. But what I will do with the other 50% is realize that I haven't communicated something clearly enough. So I need to rewrite that bit to communicate what I'm trying to communicate. So do you, how do you choose an editor? Somebody who likes the type of stuff, that, the, the genres that I'm writing. Uh, if they don't like the genre, then it's no use having them as an editor because they won't have built up um, a lot of the... Uh, personality associated with the genre. I mean, yes, if I write something science fiction, I prefer science fiction fans to read it. If I write something that's high fantasy, I prefer them to read it. If I write something that is um, semi-factual, I prefer somebody who is just normal to read it. Um, so yeah, most of my editors tend to be geeks. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I actually want to add that because I've had an experience with editors in the past for some strange reason. I don't know. Anyway, my editors, uh, I had an editor for a while who was, who liked to joke about, who liked to make jokes while pointing out errors. Does that make sense? And yeah. it ticked me off. Every yeah. time it ticked me off. Because I take, I happen to write is one of the very few things that I happen to take seriously. 
So if I'm going to treat it with respect, I expect my editor to treat it with respect. Now, the point I'm trying to make is it's not just knowing the genre. It's the interpersonal relationship between the editor and the writer. If you don't get along, the editor will point out mistakes and the writer will essentially ignore them. At least it works in my case. Yeah. So, oh, there's yeah. A, so you have there's to that, you have to you have to get along with your editor definitely. It's a working partnership. It's not a simple service arrangement. For me, it was quite easy. I needed an editor who has been using Google Plus, and I found one. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> who did you and how how did you find that one person? Well, I crowdsourced on my from my Finnish page. Gotcha. There's a there's a great uh, comment. Can I, can from I, can I, Go ahead. So, sorry, can I just can I just answer one of Jason's questions? Yes. From the chat, he asked about um, whether it's necessary to have an editor if you're self-published. I would say that at the very least, having an editor who will check all the grammar and spelling is necessary. You don't necessarily need a story editor, but you do need somebody to check the grammar and spelling. Because oh, sorry, that was Luis. Not Jason, my bad. Right. <laughs> but yes, you need to have somebody to do that because there are no automated tools for it. Automated tools mess up any sort of grammar and um, spell checking because there are so many words that may be the wrong word, but it's just a typo, but it's still a correctly spelled word. So somebody to do that, somebody to sit back and read with a fine tooth comb what's happened, uh, all your text, and mm. point out that, hey, you should use that word there because that doesn't make any sense in any language. You know, yeah. It's is very useful because the last thing you want is somebody to go and buy your work and then leave you a bad review just because it doesn't seem like it's professionally finished. Exactly. I was actually going to mention that when you're, when you're e-publishing, everything depends on your reputation. That editor will give you a good reputation right from the get-go, at least mm. so far as the spelling and the profession, actual professional appearance of the book goes. I mean, everything from the cover to the editing to all that fun stuff, you should at least put some money into that because especially your first book, your first book will make or break you. Oh, well, that's a good thing, yes. Well, I, I, very, heard very that, good tip. I heard that the first book is always going to be your worst one, and so... You shouldn't worry about it too much because you can always go and update that. What, no? the, uh, <laughs> yeah, they never what, what I would say to that, <laughs> what I would say to that is that if at any point you're going back and reading something you've written years ago and you think it is fantastic and you can't believe you wrote something so good, you haven't progressed as a writer. You should be cringing at those old stories that you've written. If you're not cringing at them, you just haven't moved on. It's still at the same stage. <laughs> you know, that's why your no, first book is your worst book. Now, I'm going to take that, and I'm going to add to it, just like I do to everything else. Right? I know. Okay, I'm, 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 like I'm working on to revisions. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're just here to set me up. That's your, that's your purpose here. Um, no, but seriously, yeah, my short stories is what I'm known for is my flash fiction. I am editing my flash fiction right now. Now, how this ties into to what you've actually said is, you know, how you should cringe at your old stories. I don't cringe at my old stories. You want to know why? I take those old stories, I put them on a piece of paper, and they go from 500 words to 2,000 words to thus far 4,000 words. Yeah. I make them better. I polish them up. I make them what they need to be. I make them something I can be proud of. And then I republish them and make millions and millions of dollars. Because oh, I'm excellent. Awesome. You, you see that? That's I, my garage plan. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about revisions, though, Adam. What I know, I'm but I'm about just saying. Is stories that were finished. And then you go back and read them and you think they're awesome. But you shouldn't really. You should see the... Um, Unless they're a different kind of story. If your purpose yeah. was met with that first story, 
and you're writing a new genre, you should never be ashamed of any story you write. Now, maybe you should box it up and put it in a corner to be forgotten for all eternity. <laughs> but you should yeah, write that, like, like, you, you, you that story you wrote in the 16, huh? That, that story oh, that story, in the that one? I am not ashamed yeah, that of that one. one. You want to know why? Because that was a <laughs> learning experience. That yeah, was a if learning you experience. Ashamed, I think you'd have sent it to me by now. <laughs> yeah, I'm not ashamed of it at all. It's way over there in the corner, boxed up. It will never see the light of day again. Accept it. Actually, oh, yeah, I'm yeah. You are, going to take you are that a closet writer. Uh, that... Sorry? I'm, I'm very much Adam a closet is a closet writer. writer. Yes. Oh, yeah. My name is Adam, <clears throat> and I'm a writer. I wrote 2,000 words today. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Oh, I grind up that paper. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping okay, to. Okay, guys, hit. we are um, right on time. So and we are done. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note. This is a high note. So, just I'm going to open it up. If we, if anyone has questions, uh, Louis, Paul, if you have any questions okay. about nonfiction writing, how to go about something, go ahead and do that now. And um, and if not, we're we're going to end this wonderful, amazing hangout. <laughs> ah. Go ahead. No, we're good. You can unmute your mics at this point if you actually want to ask a question. Anybody? We're good. Yay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Lewis. Looks Lewis. like Lewis. I want to talk to Lewis. Lewis. I wanted to talk to Lewis. Why haven't you finished this book that you've been working on for seven years? Um, <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. 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 We can hear you. We can hear well, you. We Go could ahead. hear you, Lewis, but you've done quite well, again. Well, now we can. How much sugar does Adam eat a day? Well, that's a very good question. Let me explain something to you, sir. <laughs> yes. Um, I eat zero grams of sugar act today, actually. I am sugar free. <laughs> I am you see this cup that I've been drinking? This lovely cup right here? This what is that I mean? This is a jar of sweets. <laughs> Things like this stay on my desk for one reason and one reason alone. So that I have something nearby when I'm completely starving because I've gotten so stuck in writing for three hours that I've forgotten to eat. <laughs> These are, I'm assuming, good times. <laughs> oh, yes, they're, they're the best times. But, yes, that's why. Big, I have, big, big. I have, I have only three steps to our fridge. <laughs> now that's I good. have positioned good myself very strategically. Guys, how much time do you spend writing every day and how much time do you spend interacting on Google Plus? Or any other, you Does know, Does anybody marketing? have an exact answer to this besides me? I don't okay. have an exact answer to it. I'd say that it really depends on how into the story I'm writing I am. If I'm very into it, I'll spend more time writing. If I'm not that into it, I will spend more time on Google Plus. I spend nine hours a day writing. Wow. I can tell wow. you that as an exact. That's part of the reason I have two projects set up. I have one main project, which I work on most of the time, and then I have my secondary project, which I work on during breaks. I work for an hour. I take ten-minute breaks. Wow. Pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> I am, I'm very structured. It's one of the few things that I'm structured in. I would oh, not agree with that. I'm very unstructured. Uh, oh, with me that. it depends so much. With me it depends so much. Um, well, I tend to stay at least, if it's a regular, if it's a normal day, I tend to spend at least six hours on Google+. Plus per every 24 hours, seven days a week at least, sometimes more, sometimes less, depends about the writing also. Do you 
Is that because you're writing about Google Plus and you do some of your research in it? Yes, of course. And I also I scan all the time. I have you know uh, the hashtag searches on and everything about uh, Google Plus here, Google Plus there. So. I'm like a hawk, you know, going down. If I see an article about Google Plus, also I use Scoopit for it. I use Google, uh, I use Twitter, I use Facebook for that. I use StumbleUpon. I use many different platforms, but just to find and spread information about Google Plus. And uh, so it's really hard to tell when I'm working on the book and when I'm just having fun on Google Plus. Well, or maybe they are just one thing. <laughs> I actually well, um, one of the things that I do one of the things I'm actually very regimented about is you'll see me signing off with Google Plus at about 10-ish every night and especially the last week or so um, from 10 p.m. till 4 a.m. is pure writing nothing else wow I actually do do a lot of interacting. Anybody who follows me knows this. I do do yes. a lot of interacting, talking to people. As one of uh, my editor was talking about it, and she says, yeah, I, you were in my daily stream, but I had to put you into your own stream because you kept flooding, which is rather funny because I, in my humble opinion, I don't post nearly as much as I used to, but I do make sure that I post while I'm working things like, you know, things about... How, how, how much of a hard time I'm having with the revisions, how much of a hard time I'm having doing me meeting deadlines, all that fun stuff. And most, I actually go out of my way to do that because I make all these wonderful comments about how awesome I am and how fantastic I am and all this fun stuff, and it's all a game to me. I'm just having fun. You, and you, I you, notice, you notice how you've got two very different types of writers here. You've got him who's talking about himself all the time. You've got me. I just like to sit in the background and let everybody else talk. Oh, yeah, you took over for a good half hour that first bit, I'm telling you. <laughs> I noticed. But I know you did. Is, I know you did. I was just tweaking your nose. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. well, since, since this is a public broadcast, the specific hand gestures which I would produce for you, I will not. You're welcome, Ethan. <laughs> Don't worry. I, 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 they're implied. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, from now on, this gesture, you know uh -huh. what it means. I know exactly uh, what it means. Too. We are going to be on a high note. Let me answer the question. <laughs> Oops. But I did go out of my way to do it because I don't want to seem like Superman now that I never have any trouble with my writing, is the basic point. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. There we go. <laughs> I have a lot to learn, I notice. <laughs> <laughs> no, you just have to get a little crazier. Yeah, you just need to start writing fiction and everything will... Okay. <laughs> you just need to get a little crazier. Every, every year you have to get just a little crazier. Okay, I'll try. I want to I thank promise. you so much for uh, staying even 10 minutes longer. And thank you, Ipad. Thank you, Ipad. And this will be published on G Plus Go Gal in about 10 minutes. And for more information about nonfiction writing, Yana is right there, her stream. Uh, for more fiction, crazy fiction, Adam, <laughs> sci-fi fiction, are you? <laughs> and Louis, you need one of them to help you finish your book. And yes, we will Louis. see you. <laughs> Please, I expect a PM. We're going to talk about this book. <laughs> yes. And uh, this Thursday at 11 a.m., we have an interview um, about technology in marketing and crowdsourcing and how you do all that stuff on the internet. So hey, interesting. Yes. Cool. I'll be here. Thank, Thank you, Ifat. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>